to start now. Sir, uh, can I start? Yes. Sir, should we start? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, sir. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the fifth day of National Workshop on Blockchain and Smart Contract Technology 2021. We start today's session with a tech talk by Professor Kannan Srinathan on distributing trust, the blockchain approach. <laughs> professor Kannan Srinathan is an assistant professor at IIIT Hyderabad. He is an alumnus of IIT Madras, where he did his PhD in computer science and engineering. His research interests include cryptography, distributed computing, and quantum algorithms. He has published over 100 research papers in reputed international journals and conference proceedings. He is a recipient of IBM Outstanding PhD Student Award 2006 and Microsoft Young Faculty Fellowship Award in 2008. I request you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shall we go to the session? Yeah, it will be clear. Sound is not proper, sir. No, so, hello. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, 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 it's okay, sir. Yeah, it's okay, sir. Uh, this session will be in two parts. So, uh, first one, one hour, then there's a break, and then another one hour. So, we'll, we'll be talking about distributing trust to the blockchain approach in both the sessions. Uh, the contents of this talk essentially is the following. So it turns out that blockchains solve a problem. Now the problem is not a easy one. The so problem is a hard problem. And the solution is not a normal one. It is a very pleasing solution. So we'll be talking about what is the hard problem that blockchain solves? What is the pleasing solution? So this would be in the first hour. In the second part, we'll be talking about what are the other plausible solutions. Some of them could be futuristic also. And that will lead to what, what kind of future problems which in turn will have solutions based on the same approach. So we will understand the blockchain approach, what it solves, how it solves it, why is what it solves hard, why is what, what blockchain does pleasing. We will try and see whether the solutions can be adapted to give new futuristic solutions. And then we'll also see whether new kinds of problems can be solved in the future using the same approach. So this is what is uh, the layout. So let's begin with the problem. So I'm calling it the big picture, but notice that for every big picture, there will be a smaller one as well as a bigger one. So this is not the biggest picture. There you can you can think of bigger pictures than this, or you can go into the smaller details than this. So the level that we are talking about is, I'll give you three English words. The first word is trust. I'm, I'm particularly saying this English word so that we don't get embroiled in trying to formally define them. We intuitively understand the linguistic meaning of the rhetoric trust. So we'll, that is sufficient for, for us with respect to this slide. We can look at uh, formulating the approach rather than formulating the word trust, which is probably much harder. It becomes slightly philosophical. So we leave it as a leave it as English word. So we all understand what trust is. We all understand what value is. We all understand what size. Here, size is the number of users of of the asset and of the system uh, or of the object. So there is. There is trust, there is value, there is size. All these are uh, nominal 
canonical uh, English words with the same canonical connotation. We need not uh, try to formalize uh, each of these as of now. But even with with the common sense understanding of what trust is, what value is, and what size is, some things are known with respect to their interrelationship. For instance, we all know that trust begets value. So for instance, suppose you have a piece of paper, you write this piece of paper is like 10 rupee note or 500 rupee note. That actually doesn't give you value because there is no trust equivalent to uh, the value that is there on the person who is writing that. However, if the governor of RBI signs saying that the bearer of this particular piece of paper is uh, promised to be returned uh, back some value of say 500 rupees, then automatically the trust becomes value. And notice that the governor of RBI is a very trustworthy position within the boundaries of of the country India, not so much in say Pakistan and therefore the lack of trust in RBI in Pakistan will ensure that the currency is uh, no longer valid there. So, so wherever there is trust, there is value that everyone knows. So this is just an example. Uh, you could give many more examples, but the point here is trust begets value. That is the point. Now, equally well known, is that value because size and usage. So we know the total number of users of, of uh, say 500 rupees notes is uh, very high and growing. And that is because of the value. It is not, it's not uh, because of, of the fact that if uh, there was no trust and therefore if there was no value, then probably there will not be any users or there won't be any size, right? So trust begets value, well known. Value begets size, well known. The buck usually stops here. It is uh, not very well known or probably not even true in general that size will automatically beget trust. The reason is we all see there are a lot of Ponzi schemes. So, so you, you create a hype for trust and and the hype the trust will give you hype value. For instance, how do you hype trust? So you 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 actually uh, say this is a cheat fund and a well known cheat fund. You you hype the trust by giving giving some returns to the initial investors and and then uh, that will hype the value and and uh, and the size in turn. So just because there are a lot of users or investors in in the cheat fund does not mean that automatically the trust grows the fund manager can close shop any day and, and that will become a Ponzi scam. So notice that most of the scams happen because the, the buck stops here. So they create some illusionary trust and that will create some value and that will create real size. So it is very, very important to note that even uh, virtual or hyped trust and hyped value can actually create real size. And then if the buck stops here, the real size is not going to become real trust or real value. Therefore, the scams could continue and proliferate in a big country like India uh, at forever. So one way to stop that, all kinds of Ponzi scams, is suppose we have a system that, that actually can convert uh, trust from size. So if let trust beget value, let value beget size. These things already are natural and happen automatically. If we, if you have a technology which can beget trust from size, so for instance, if there are lot of, lots of users, uh, that if you have a technological solution which can actually get real trust, then notice that the real trust will beget real value and then the uh, will get more size and the size is always real. And the real size will, will get even for the real trust and, and therefore, this would be a magical solution where all kinds of scams and other things will become non-existent because it is a closed loop now and therefore you could in principle bootstrap from any point. So I, so far it is necessary to us, for us to start from trust because trust begets value, value begets size. But if you close the loop, if size can beget trust back, 
then you could start from anywhere and it will bootstrap and jumpstart the entire system. For instance, if you hype the trust by mistake, it will give a hype value, but size is real. Because size is real, you will get back the real trust and things will be okay. Or like in the case of Bitcoins, you could, you could hype the value first and that will give you a size and that will give you trust and then you will get the real value. So, so notice that since this is a closed loop and you can, you can bootstrap from anywhere, you can jumpstart the system, not necessarily from, from trust, like it is usually done uh, for most uh, systems. Uh, and usually the government of India is the only thing that we trust in this country uh, for such systems. And therefore, you, it is always the initiative of the government to, to be, uh, start with some trust and then that will be get value and then that will be get users and such. However, uh, in a decentralized system, in the sense, if it will be magical if you can decentralize in the sense uh, size can we get trust back, then we can see that you can bootstrap in anywhere and you can jumpstart from anywhere. Of course, you have to still jumpstart because to begin with, there is no trust, there is no value, there is no size. So you have to start somewhere and therefore you could either hype the value or you could hype, uh, either get size first or you could start from trust as usual. Any, any way is fine, but because it's a closed loop, scams are, are unlikely to take place uh, in such a setting. So of course, uh, we are not talking about Bitcoins here because they are also going outside the loop. You can convert Bitcoin back to dollar and other things. And th those, again, we will find that you're going outside this loop and we're not worried about, about the uh, scams that can take place outside this loop. So. Within this loop, certainly it, it will be magical if you can do this. So, so that is the big picture and that is the problem we'll try to essentially solve. And uh, what is so difficult? So can a collection of untrustworthy, it's a large collection because we have the size, uh, but they are not trustworthy individually. Can a collection of untrustworthy nodes or entities or people or whatever simulate a trustworthy uh, no, uh, uh, trustworthy one. So, so question is, can you distribute trust there such that the, it's the, each component is is actually untrustworthy, uh, uh, the distrust in each part of it, but the whole is more than some of the parts. The whole actually has uh, trust uh, well and truly beyond the requirement, and the adequate trust is actually got from simulating. Uh, this uh, node from a collection of untrustworthy nodes. Now, distributing workload is, is very popular. For instance, you look at cluster computing uh, or grid computing and stuff like that. Distributing memory also is very popular. You look at cloud computing or uh, say DC++ and stuff like that. Network file systems and all. So distributing computation workload we know distributing, uh, say, the uh, memory is also very popular. Distributing I.O. is also very popular. So for instance, look at ubiquitous computing, pervasive computing. Uh, there is, you have access points from anywhere, so you distributed the uh, I.O. So distributing A also is getting popular nowadays. So overall, people know how to distribute stuff, and, and today's, Lecture, we are going to see uh, about not distributing workload, or it's not about cluster computing, it's not distributing uh, memory, it's not network files, so it's, it's, or cloud, it's not distributing IO, so it's not about ubiquitous or pervasive computing, it is about distributing trust. So, however, the questions will be similar. Can a cluster of untrust uh, or cluster of, of say, a uh, low computation not simulate a supercomputer that will be cluster computing can a cluster of low memory not simulate a, a cloud memory that will be like cloud computing can a, a cluster of uh, uh, say uh, io devices simulate a pervasive uh, environment or ubiquitous environment that will be like ubiquitous computing so can a cluster of untrustworthy not simulate a trustworthy node so that is this is the question we are asking okay that's the question all right so what is uh, so difficult so the difficulty is, if you can see, there is a famous proverb, too many cooks spoil the broth. 
Now, I have added an, a term, too many good cooks while the brats. So the reason is, I don't want to, I want to differentiate from the fact that uh, if there are too many cooks, this is likely to be bad cooks and therefore uh, some of the cooks who don't know how to cook will, will come and spoil the brats. So that is not the idea here. Even if all the cooks are, are specialists and, and top of the uh, uh, job cooks, the intended meaning of too many cooks spoil the broth is even if each of them is a genuine cook and a master at that, consensus is not easy. So, so to take decisions in a decentralized system is so hard that the broth gets spoiled because of, of non-arrival of consensus. So how much, what should be the exact recipe to follow? What should be the the uh, uh, mechanization used, what should be the amount of salt, what should be like sugar and, and what should be, where should you buy the ingredients? So there are many, many questions that, that actually uh, will arise when you are cooking. And uh, not all of these questions will have the same answer from everybody. And if there is only one quick or uh, one cook or the centralized head cook, then now his answer or her answer is the final and that the consensus is unnecessary. However, if, if it is a peer-to-peer -peer cook system, then you need to make everybody agree and that is not easy, even if every cook uh, uh, around there is hell-bent on actually contributing to the system. Even then, consensus is not easy. That, we, that is the problem. However, in real life, for instance, in you are trying to take a collection of untrustworthy nodes. Some of the nodes could be outright under the control of the adversary. And therefore we are not talking about too many good cooks, but we are talking about too many bad cooks actually, because everyone there wants to make money. So if, if in the Bitcoin network, there is there is uh, no single node which is trustworthy. Everyone is out there to swindle. I mean, it could be, I, I'm not trying to, to demean or uh, give a bad, twist or connotation to what's going on. But let us say that possibility is, is uh, potentially possible or existent that everyone there wants to actually uh, play around and so that they can please the system. So in such a setting where every cook wants to spoil the broth, not only is consensus difficult, how do you actually continue cooking in such a system? For instance, it is very well known that uh, drops of water can make a mighty ocean. So drops of distrust can make a mighty ocean of distrust. So notice that a collection of untrustworthy nodes can very easily simulate a super untrustworthy node, right? So it, it, it's very easy to blow up what is there. So each one brings a drop of, of distrust and therefore you put together, you should get a ocean of distrust. The question is not, how to get a ocean of distrust from, from drops of distrust. The question is from drops of distrust, how do you get a ocean of trust? So, so when everybody is there outright to be malicious and uh, trying to freeze the system, how do you, how do you get uh, as, uh, trust uh, from the underlying network? So that's the challenge. So technically speaking, as you can see, consensus is, is the the main thing, if you make everybody agree on what to do, uh, then the larger the number of people who come into agreement, the more trust that can be built in the system. And, and let's see the problem now. A technical problem. This is with respect to consensus. The problem is called Byzantine agreement. So this is a fundamental problem in distributed computing. It, is, it was first coined in, in, in 1980 and therefore, it has been in existence well and truly uh, before the concept of blockchains and, and the like. So it is a fundamental problem in distributed computing and there is no need to be surprised by it because as I said, not only for cooking, anything that is uh, going to involve some distribution and say collection of peers and, and stuff like that requires you to do consensus and requires you, you to do agreement because for instance, you have to agree on whether you want to collaborate. And if you agree that you want to collaborate, you want to you want to know on what to collaborate. If you agree on, on what to collaborate, we have, we have to see like what program to run. 
If you agree on what program to run, you have to agree that the program terminated. If you agree that the program terminated, you have to agree on what output it gave. And if you agree on the output that it gave, you should also see if check whether uh, uh, the, the output is correct and you agree on the on the verification. You should agree on the time. So this is called synchronization. So you should you should agree on 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 uh, uh, what to do with the output. So say so things don't stop here. Say so every step in a collaborative approach is about agreement. So if, if the collection of nodes have to collaborate at every instance, they have to agree on what is, is going on now, why it is doing that, and, and what to be the next, and what is the output, and whether things are going fine. And the, so things never end. So agreement is fundamental to distributed computing is because agreement is fundamental to any kind of collaboration, uh, not just the blockchain type of collaboration. And therefore, there's no surprise that budget and agreement is a fundamental problem. So what is the problem? So technically, the problem can be posed in, in multiple ways. So I'll try and pose it in two different ways. And uh, one, the first way, budget and agreement problem. So you have a collection of processors or processes, however you want to call it. It could be different uh, computers, uh, Atomic computers themselves, or, or it could be different threads within uh, the same processor. So, so all that is setting dependent, but we call it a party here, right? So each party has an input, say a single bit input, and it has to end with an output, single bit output. We want a protocol such that even if there are faults in the system, and the faults could be Byzantine, by which we mean the fault is likely to do whatever it wants. It can, it need not even run the code that you are that you gave. It can replace the code, delegated code that you gave with its own code and try to disrupt the system as it pleases. It could actually crash the system and not respond. So there, are, there are, it can basically do whatever it wants. So a, a corrupted node or a, or a faulty node is is free to behave. Uh, in any which way it pleases. So, given that there are faults in the system, what we want to achieve is agreement. First up. So, what do you mean by that? All non faulty parties must output the same value. So, let us output also as a single bit. So, if you can know, if you know how to agree on one bit, you know how to agree on, on multiple bits. So, so, let us say input is one bit, output is one bit. So all non-faulty process or parties must decide on the same output. That's the main thing. Now, why that alone is insufficient? Because if you say agreement is the sole purpose and goal, then a simple solution like all of you agree on some default value, say all of you print zero, then the output of every, every node will be zero unless the node is faulty and trying to print up something else. So, uh, you cannot force a faulty person to output the same value. He is free to change, he or she is free to change uh, the output. So all non-faulty parties decide on the same output. If that alone is the requirement, satisfying it is fairly easy. You just say everybody outputs the same value. But that kind of agreement is useless. Why? Because we, what is the point everybody outputting a default value? So let us say you should agree on the time uh, uh, of, uh, of the event. Uh, but so if you, you want to agree on something that is dynamic, uh, there's no point saying I'll agree on a default time. So, so point is you want to agree on what is the current time. You want to agree on the current output. You want to agree whether the current program terminated. And all these are, are uh, dynamic and therefore we want a valid agreement. And a valid agreement is the output must be the input of some non-faulty party. So notice that uh, you can say each uh, each party inputs this version of time and, and you run a protocol and everybody actually synchronizes and agrees on some time. Each party outputs its version, whether it terminated or not. Uh, so whether the transaction uh, aborted or transaction actually got through. So each one has a one bit input and, and the entire system has to now agree on which of that is. Now notice that the uh, uh, output that you agree on must be the input of some non-faulty party so that at least one person feels that that thing happened and and uh, that person is not faulty and and then we say it is valid of course uh, there is no point in in delaying the agreement indefinitely forever so eventually 
uh, we want termination of, of this protocol. So you, you cannot say that uh, the agreement protocol itself is, is uh, not going to finish uh, for a while. So, or, or for, uh, it's going to run indefinitely. So they had unique termination condition for any solution uh, if you want. So you, sometimes it may not be possible to give that. So we can do a probabilistic version of, of termination also. Uh, or you can do a game theoretic version of termination like we'll see in blockchain. So, so at the end of the day, termination is, is a common sense thing. So if you remove that, you are looking for only two things here. We are looking for valid agreement. So agreement is everyone should output same value. Valid it is, it should be the input of some somebody, some honest person. So this is the problem. So what is so difficult in solving the problem? Let us see what is so difficult. But before that, we look at yet another way in which you can pose the same problem. So yet another way you can pose the same problem is how do you simulate the existence of a physical broadcast channel in a peer-to-peer -peer system? So in a peer-to-peer -peer network, there is no physical broadcast channel. There are only message passing point-to-point -point connections. So in the absence of a physical broadcast channel, how do you actually simulate it, the presence of it? So if I, if I want to broadcast my message to everyone, how do you do that? Now, in the presence of physical broadcast channel, as you can see, agreement is easy. Uh, for instance, everybody can broadcast their input and you now everybody knows everybody else's input and you can run some local function and everybody will get the same answer. You could easily make it valid. So notice that uh, in the presence of a physical broadcast channel, agreement is, is straightforward. And uh, equally true is in the presence of a protocol for agreement, you can actually simulate uh, broadcast by simply asking the uh, sender to to send this message to everybody and make everybody agree. Notice that in the absence of of a present and agreement protocol, simulating broadcast in a peer-to-peer -peer network is not easy. The first solution that comes to mind, or common sense solution, is you. If why can't the sender who is trying to broadcast? send his message to everybody. So why can't you do a collection of unicas? So why can't I send my data to everybody and say broadcast is complete? Because if if I can if I can route my message to every everybody in the network, to broadcast, I just need to do this multiple times. So if there are n nodes in the network, uh, including me, so I, I, I would I would say give data to me locally and to the rest n minus one, I would uh, do a point-to-point uh, -point communication and say, this is my message, take it. So what is wrong in, in simulating broadcast using such a common sense method? The, there are multiple uh, problems. I have only taken the top two problems. So first of the top two is, is that when you are looking at simulating broadcast, you want it to be atomic. That is whether either broadcast should happen or not happen. When you're trying to Simulate broadcast by collection of unicast, uh, there could be trouble. For instance, look at the following scenario. So A is broadcasting to B and C. Let us say there are only three people in the network, let us say. A sends to B, A sends to C. So that would be simulating broadcast. Now notice that if you are trying to simulate it by collection of unicast, the following is possible. After a sent the message to B, but before A could send the message to C, A fails. There is a power failure at A or there is a bomb blast or whatever. So A sent the message to B, A is yet to send the message to C, and A fails. Now notice that here B believes that broadcast happened, C believes that broadcast is not happened, whereas if it was a physical broadcast channel that was present, such a such a scenario wouldn't arise because either both B and C will know that broadcast happened or both B and C will know that broadcast did not happen. Therefore, atomically simulating broadcast is, is not easy. You have to follow up your sending your message to everybody individually with a protocol like a Byzantine agreement protocol for people to actually agree on the fact that everybody has, has received something and, and uh, agree on the on the value. That is first point. So first point is you want to simulate broadcast is not straightforward because if broadcast is collection of 
unicast, then how do you know that all of it has happened? Maybe there is a power failure after it is initiated for some people before it is initiated for others. That creates a lot of problems. Okay. Second is even bigger problem. There could be best intent files, and in fact, sometimes the sender itself could be Byzantine, which would mean what? Which would mean I can A can send a message M1 to B and a message M2, which is not are different from M1 to C, and B believes that the broadcasted message is M1, C believes that the broadcasted message is M2, and notice that if there was a physical broadcast channel, even an adversarial sender cannot fool the system by giving different people to different, different uh, values to different uh, parts of the network. Because it is a physical broadcast channel, either you broadcast M1 or broadcast M2, you are free to change your mind on the message, but you are not free to confuse the network if there is a broadcast channel. But if there is no broadcast channel, it's just a peer-to-peer -peer network, then a Byzantine fault can easily, or a Byzantine fault sender can easily confuse over the network the left side of the network could, could be confused with the receiving M0 and right side receiving M1 and so on. And such things are very, very complicated in, in cryptocurrencies or, or in uh, uh, Bitcoin type systems because what if I spend my Bitcoin and inform that I used my Bitcoins to buy a car to the left side of the network and I reuse the same Bitcoins to buy, uh, say, uh, some land. So, so which of the thing is true because I can actually cannot spend my same bitcoins on two different transactions at the same time. But notice that that's what I can do. If it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, I can inform uh, say uh, some part of the network that I'm using it this way and they will authorize that and I can inform some other part of the network that I'm doing something else and they will authorize that. And in the absence of a broadcast channel, Byzantine Falls can create havoc. In, in the problem of consensus or problem of simulating broadcast is very clear. And therefore, even though we can see that patient and agreement can be posed in two different ways. So one is to say that agreement and a valid agreement is what we require. Other is to say that I want to simulate a physical broadcast channel even though none exists. So all these are equal because a broadcast can give you agreement uh, and agreement can give you broadcast, right? So how, how do you simulate uh, uh, agreement solutions if broadcast is there, ask everybody to broadcast and, and everybody can now agree because everyone knows everybody's input. Uh, you can run a local function on, on what you see. Uh, how do you achieve broadcast if there is a uh, agreement protocol? Just unicast the value to everybody that, and take that as the input and, and run a Byzantine agreement protocol on top of that. Now everybody will have the same same answer and that is the answer that you wanted to, to send because if you are honest, Sender, you would send same value to everybody, so all honest people will have the same input and validity condition says the output is equal to the input of some honest person, which is same as the message that you wanted to broadcast. So these are multiple ways of saying the same thing, but the, the question is, why is it a hard problem? So we'll go <coughs> further than that. Not only is it a hard problem, in some certain settings, there are proofs of impossibility also, which uh, can be circumvented using cryptography and circumvented further using game theory and that is the blockchain approach. So let us see why is a purely distributed computing solution sometimes non-existent and why is uh, Byzantine agreement in some cases or in most cases that we are interested in, why is it impossible? And so what we are solving or what blockchains are solving is not just a hard problem, but a outright impossible problem. So, so, so we'll see that hard hardness as adjective there was just a uh, understatement. It is outright impossible. It is that hard. And similarly, we'll also see that the pleasingness in the solution is also an understatement. It is it is outrightly deadly pleasing. So it's not just normal pleasing. So, so let's conclude our first part with this uh, proof that if I have a network of three nodes and one of the three nodes is, is Byzantine faulty, nobody knows which one, it is impossible to actually give a Byzantine agreement protocol. So if once we look at the proof, 
it will be clear that we are up against a very hard problem. And then we'll go ahead and look at what is the pleasing solution that, that blockchains have to offer for this. So let's start with the situation. So you want, you want to say that there is a budget and agreement algorithm supposedly, suppose, and you are supposing on the contrary, the proof by contradiction. We will show that if there is a patient agreement protocol in the network of three nodes, then there is a contradiction. And therefore, there is no patient agreement protocol. And that's the proof we are looking for. What is the contradiction we'll, we'll arrive at? The way we'll proceed is, if there is a patient agreement protocol among three nodes ABC, then there must exist another distributed system which is self-consistent doing something so we we don't care about what that is so another distributed computing system consists of six nodes and that is what i have written as the network alpha in the figure so there is a network alpha which is self-consistent and doing something if there is a patient and agreement protocol in, in the uh, triangle in the in the network of a b and c what we will show is this network alpha is not uh, consistent and therefore there cannot be a present any agreement protocol. So let's begin. Uh, suppose there is a present agreement protocol in ABC and consider a setting alpha 1 where the input of B was 0, the input of C was 0 and A was faulty. I'll repeat input of B was 0, input of C of 0 and A was faulty. Right? And what kind of a fault a is a is a very clever fault. A acts like a split personality and uh, behaves like A with input zero with B and behaves like A with input one with C. And what is the exact behavior? Exact behavior is the following: if A behaves like the node A in network alpha with B and behaves like the node A prime in the network alpha with C. So A splits itself as A and A prime. Whatever A does in alpha, it will it will do in alpha one with respect to B. And whatever A dash does in alpha, it will do in C. That is easy for A because A, A can simulate two threads and behave like two nodes. And notice that executions alpha one and alpha now are indistinguishable to process B and C. Because there is B and C, both of them have input zero and A has split itself into A and A dash and therefore all network alpha one and network alpha are exactly the same. Now you are saying that in the network ABC, in the network alpha one, uh, it's a bicentral agreement protocol. Therefore, we know what is the output of B and C. What is the output of B and C? By validity condition, it has to be the input of one of the honest people. Both the honest people are having input zero. So output has to be zero and it has to be the same for all non faulty process. Therefore, we know that because uh, alpha one and alpha are indistinguishable and because in alpha one, the output of B and C is zero, we know that the output of B and C in alpha is also zero. Simply put, we know that if it is a patient and agreement protocol in alpha one, that and that protocol is indistinguishable from, from what is going on in alpha. Why? Because A is behaving like a split personality and therefore B and C cannot differentiate whether they are in alpha one or, or in alpha. And B and C decide to output zero in alpha one. They have to similarly decide to output zero in, in alpha. Similarly, consider a situation where uh, the network of uh, three nodes, A and B have input one and C is, is faulty and C behaves like a split personality. He behaves like his input is zero with, with A and behaves like his input is one uh, with B. Then notice that this A prime and B prime in the network alpha cannot differentiate whether they are in alpha or they are in alpha two. But in alpha two, we know that the output is their output is one because all the inputs are one, and therefore the output uh, all the output should be one because all the output should be same and it should be the input of somebody. So if all the inputs are same, all the outputs are same. So no, notice that uh, the outputs are one for A dash B dash, and therefore for A dash B dash the output should be one in alpha because a dash B dash cannot differentiate whether they are in alpha or whether they are in alpha 2. In alpha 2, their output is 1. Therefore, in alpha, their output is 1. So far, there is no problem. 
output of b in alpha is zero, output of c in alpha is zero, the output of b dash in, uh, is, uh, in alpha is one, the output of a dash in alpha is one. However, consider similarly a setting, uh, say where a is input is one, c is input is zero, and b is behaving as a split personality such that c and a dash cannot differentiate whether they are in alpha or in alpha three, but in alpha three, it's a Bessel diagram protocol, so it, they have the output of A dash and C should be same. Of course, it could be either zero or one, does not matter, but it should be same. It should be either zero, zero or one, one. But notice that C in alpha has already decided to output zero. A dash in alpha is already forced output one, and therefore, at least for one of them, the system becomes inconsistent. Therefore, it is impossible that there could be a Byzantine agreement protocol in the network ABC. So if there are three people and one of them is a liar, it is impossible to localize and find out who that liar is. That is what is the statement in colloquial terms. Now, if you want to see uh, why cryptography can, can come and help here, you can see that in the absence of cryptography, this proof goes through. But if digital signatures exist, then you can see that if there are two people, say B and C, and uh, say one of them is faulty. How do you know one of them is faulty? So B claims to have sent a zero, and C claims to have received a one. So surely A knows that, or the entire system knows, that one of B and C should be lying. The problem or this proof, what it says is, even though you know that one of B and C is liar, uh, who do you know is one of you and is layer because one is claiming to have sent a zero, other is claiming to receive a one, both cannot be true. Even though you know one of BNC is layer, there is no way of, of finding out whether whether the sender is lying or the receiver is lying because the sender will continue to be adamant that he has sent a zero. The receiver will be continue to be adamant that he has received a one. How how the hell are, is, a, is the network going to resolve this? Because nobody knows other than the sender and receiver, nobody knows what actually uh, was the transcript and what transcript? So, <laughs> however, if digital signatures exist, this conundrum can be broken. And and if if the sender claims to have received or sent a zero, and receiver claims to have received a one, a third party A can find out which of B and C is the liar. How? So A goes to the receiver C and asks. You claim to have received one. Show me B signature on one. Now, if if the receiver is able to show B signature on one, I know that sender is lying because if sender actually sent a zero, there is no way for the receiver to produce sender signature on one. Therefore, if you produce the signature on one, surely sender is lying. However, if receiver is lying, that is he actually received a zero, there is no way for him to produce uh, sender signature on one. And therefore, receiver will get caught if he claims that he received one. So in the presence of digital signatures, notice that this impossibility result does not hold. What does it mean? It actually means that this proof is indirectly a proof of the impossibility of digital signatures. Because if you're saying by an agreement is impossible if one out of uh, three people are faulty, and it becomes possible if digital signatures exist, and therefore digital signatures are impossible. Now that statement that perfect digital signatures are impossible is already not. We are not looking for perfect solutions. Digital signatures can have in there, you cannot have perfect secrecy or perfect security, all right. But they can have computational security, uh, where the one that cryptography focuses on, where uh, no efficient adversary can forge. Though there, there is a possibility of forging, but uh, uh, it is not within the reach of a uh, efficient strategy or efficient adversary. So. It, since perfect digital signatures don't exist, and therefore it is it is very clear that this can be deemed as a proof for the impossibility of perfect digital signatures. We are we have computationally secure digital signatures uh, under some certain conjectures today, and we can use those to solve this problem. Right? Uh, before we go to the pleasing solution of blockchains, so let us look at what we have at hand. So we have the ability to, to use distributed computing, the ability to be present everywhere, ubiquity in space. 
we have the field of cryptography like digital signatures uh, where you can assume that nobody can execute brute force attack quickly in time and then we have also have a third field that nobody can make decisions with with partial data or with partial knowledge uh, the if you want to uh, make this uh, work you need game theory and sometimes it works sometimes it does not so notice that these fields are are complementary one is about this distribution in space other other is about your speed in in time and third one is about your ability to utilize partial knowledge and since these are uh, say fields which which are have coming from different angles or perspectives when you put them together they are able to solve very hard problems like consensus and then what blockchain does distributing trust so how do you distribute trust by making these three fields come together is the second uh, part of our story is what we have done so far is we have convinced ourselves that blockchains indeed are attacking a hard problem so no question is how do we uh, solve this hard problem so let's look at the blockchain approach to solve it. so how do we do that so we do that by giving first a solution that is only based on cryptography of course it will have drawbacks it will not work we'll see why it doesn't work and bring in another field the, of distributed computing to patch it most of it will get patched but still it will not hold water in certain settings and certain situations at that point we'll bring in a third field called game theory and and give a full and final solution to the problem that final solution is what the world calls the blockchain approach today so let us see what is it that we want to solve so we could say we just want to solve the consensus problem first but we'll we'll do uh, a bit better we'll take this opportunity to to design and make our own cryptocurrencies so i want to make my own coin so i will make my own coin using cryptographic approach of course it will fail then i'll bring in distributed computing it will pass in many settings but fail in certain settings then i'll bring in game theory which will pass even in in the settings that the earlier solutions failed and that solution will call as the uh, blockchain approach so let us try and build our own cryptocurrency so to do that which i call say my coin solution which is uh, for creating our own currency what we want to know is what is it uh, what are the properties that a currency should have so we are only looking for two things one who is the current owner should be publicly verifiable so the current owner of the coin should be known publicly and it should be it should be everybody should be able to verify who is the current owner of the coin that is first point second right you should be able to transfer ownership and if you have these two automatically it becomes a currency because what is the pro main properties of a currency everybody should know who is the current owner and the current owner should be able to transfer ownership so if you have these two it it acts as a currency it acts as an asset it acts as several other things so these two properties will ensure that you can actually do uh, transactions both financial as well as uh, barter as well as all kinds of things you can do contracts smart contracts all those so essentially two properties you want is who is the current owner of that asset and whether how to how does the ownership be is being transferred to a new person so let us see how to get these two properties using cryptography and then we should be able to build or design our own fine the first property namely everybody should be able to publicly verify who is the current owner right is fairly straightforward why right? because of the publicly verifiable nature of digital signatures the current owner can sign saying that this coin belongs to me and uh, sign it so everybody can publicly verify that <laughs> the current coin belongs to this person because he is signing it of course 
to begin with there is there is the person who created the coin and everybody trusts because it is his own coin or her own coin and at this point there is no trust deficit it is his own coin her own coin i say i create my coin i sign everybody can publicly verify that it is my coin now how do you we transfer ownership so uh, the current owner can take another piece of paper and say i am transferring this coin to you and sign now of course people can can say uh, how do you know that that uh, this transaction was a direct one how do you know that nothing else happened in the middle or after you transfer can somebody say that no no before you transferred to me it it was transferred to somebody else third party and then transferred to you so the current owner may be you but how do you know that there were, the previous owner was was directly me and and uh, there was no uh, transactions in the middle so for it to be tamper proof you make a chain the hash chain so that you get tamper proofness in the entire history and uh, tamper proof history would actually uh, mean that uh, everybody can check who is the current owner and the current owner can easily you now create or append to that history and transfer ownership so how do you make it tamper proof so hash of the previous page or previous block or previous uh, uh, piece of paper or whatever previous knowledge uh, you hash of that if you say is part of this new paper notice that it it makes a hash chain and it gets the tamper proofness and therefore you have the two properties now one is everybody can check who is the current owner second is the current owner can transfer ownership for instance i created and transferred it to you you want to transfer it to somebody else so you take a third piece of paper and say current owner which is you you sign saying that i am transferring the ownership to bob and then hash of the previous page you put here so nobody can tamper tamper it and nobody can yeah, intercept it later on in, in the middle so everybody knows that the current owner is bob however this is a cryptography only solution and it does not actually hold water as a cryptocurrency and that's what we are going to see now we need other fields like distributed computing and game theory to patch the flaws in the hash chain based solution for cryptocurrencies so what can go wrong so this is the major problem of double spending so i'll tell you what can go wrong so consider the following transaction you created a coin and everybody knows you are the owner because everybody can publicly verify that you signed it no problem you can transfer the ownership to uh, say i can transfer the ownership to you by creating a new piece of paper and saying you are the current owner and and hash of the previous uh, block i can store it here so job well done similarly uh, you can transfer the ownership by storing the hash of of that uh, previous block in the next block and and then signing saying that i am transferring the ownership to alice till here there is no problem however nothing stops you cryptographically from creating a fourth piece of paper and saying that i am transferring the same uh, coin to bob as well so because to to transfer a coin all you need is create a new sheet of paper sign it saying that i, I am transferring this to the such and such a person and hash of the previous block you store in that so you, so both the transfer to alice as well as transfer to bob are cryptographically equally valid now question is why is this a problem this is a problem because no no nobody knows who is the current owner uh, and i'm because so the current owner is both alice as well as bob so how can there be two different owners of the same asset at the same time now notice that this happened because it is no longer a chain so as long as it is a single chain there is no issue at all who is the current owner we know the problem comes when the chain property disappears when it becomes a dag like this when there is there is bifurcations uh, which happens because of double spending uh, when the chain property disappears 
you have no idea of what happened to the uh, currency ownership because there are two different owners possibly for the same asset. So our aim now is to get back the chain property and, and everything will be fine. So how do you get back the chain property? So this problem of, of double spending is a tough one because to get back the chain property, you should ask somebody to say, which of these two chains would you choose? Now, whom will you ask? If there is a trusted entity whom you can ask which chains to use, you may as well not even worry about these chains. You may as well ask the person who is the current owner. So like how credit card works, like how uh, different banking systems work. You could actually use the bank as the trusted party to find out who is the current owner of the asset. <laughs> End of the story. So our main job was to find out who is the current owner. And that job is unsatisfied and in inadequately solved in the absence of the chain property. In the presence of chain property, cryptography solves it fairly well. So in the absence of the chain property, when, when the chain bifurcates, nobody knows who is the current owner. Somebody has to tell who is the current owner to the rest of the world. If there is a centralized authority which can actually mediate and find out which of the chains is the current one, both chains are equally valid. So you are free to choose which are randomly, but somebody has to do that. And if you have a trusted entity to do that, then the whole problem can be actually uh, solved because it's a cash 22 situation, solved by as asking the name of the current owner directly. You don't need this entire hash chaining and all this overhead. We can just say, I trust you, you keep you keep a centralized database like banking and keep tra track of who is the current owner of what. Like that's about it. So the problem of double spending is that even though everyone knows that double spending happened, there is nobody who is a centralized authority to correct it. And in the presence of any centralized authority to correct it, the problem becomes trivial because the centralized authorities can actually do the original job itself. The point of decentralization is that you don't want any such centralized authority. You want trust from size and not trust for, from trust itself. So let's see how to solve it. So if uh, you can trust the uh, owner of the coin, let us say, who created the coin, let us see a solution. And then we we'll look at how do you simulate trust using Byzantine agreement. Then, of course, how do you solve Python agreement, which is impossible yeah, using game theory? That we'll come to that later. So, so how do you solve the double spending problem? So you can publish the transaction history and you can have, have the person who created the coin, let us say, to choose or any other centralist authority to choose one of the chains as the actual chain and, and say the other chain is invalid. And how uh, how does he do that? He will give a signature uh, and uh, uh, to the chain, which is the actual chain. So he, he uh, so each time there is there is confusion, he will come and say, I choose this and stuff like that. So, so if you trust the centralist authority, job is easy to do. However, in the absence of trust in centralized authority. And that is the main problem that we are solving. How do you go about doing it? We have to decentralize the trust. So first, we are welcome steps towards decentralizing trust me is using Byzantine agreement. And uh, what is the approach? Let the network, uh, all the players in the system agree on the correct chain. So, so whenever there are, there are uh, the, the absence of chain property because there are multiple chains forking and other things. There is no centralized authority to to say which is the uh, chain that that is to be continued and which is the chain that is to be removed or alpha so that you get back the chain property and therefore the currency property. You can tell uh, tell everybody or verify who is the current owner. So you just have to have a system to agree on the correct chain. How does the peer-to-peer -peer system agree on the correct chain? So we have to solve the Byzantine agreement problem. Unfortunately, we saw that the Byzantine agreement problem is, is not easily solved. Uh, in one out of three setting, we said not easily solved. But if, 
if you have a one out of four sitting, that is if less than one third of the people are, are corrupt, then there is a solution. So if there are four people, the solution consists of the following. So this is a Bison agreement protocol solution uh, for four people of which one is faulty. In general, 3T plus one where T is the number of faults. So each, pro each process sends its input to every other person. Every person exchanges all the four values that it received in the first round to everybody else. So basically, it's two round protocol. Each one sends uh, its input to everybody. So, and then everybody sends all that received in the first round to everybody. So if, at this step, you can see that everyone receives 16 values. So first round, I see, uh, four people send uh, their in one bit of input to everybody. So each person receives four bits from the network, one bit including locally from itself. So whatever four bits that was received in first round is again sent to everybody in the second round. And therefore, you can see that at the end of second round, everyone has received 16 bits, which they can arrange in a matrix like this, saying that the MIJ is what uh, the party I says it received from party J in the first round, right? Uh, to uh, at one particular process k, so that this uh, that is what we have written in the top. So now notice that at most one row and the corresponding column, which I am showing in black here, for say the zero row and zero column, or the first row and first column, or the second row and second column, or the third and co third column can be in the adversary's control because adversary can corrupt one of the nodes. This is the assumption here. If you can corrupt one of the nodes, say the zero node, you can control the first row and you can control the first column so you can you can control what you send in the first round you can to everybody you can also control what you send in the second round uh, so so you can control one column one and one row but notice that by controlling one column and one row the majority in in every other thing cannot be altered because notice that if there are uh, uh, say four zeros originally and and uh, so you have a matrix of of uh, all if if i have input one i would send my input one to everybody and uh, three of them would would forward it correctly and therefore my one will be reached as one to to the process k uh, so you will have you should have been one 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 say in the in the column However, one of them is under control of the three, so which one we don't know, so it goes away. But one, 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 even if one of them becomes zero, the majority cannot be altered. And therefore, there could be a local majority based function of this matrix. Such that if one of them is faulty, the local function will also always output the same value for the matrix received by all the people, and that is the idea. So this is the present agreement protocol for one out of four. We can extend this protocol for n t out of n as follows. You have to run for t plus one round. So like we said one out of four, so we ran for two rounds. Each round, everybody has to send all the things they received in the previous round to everybody else. Therefore, instead of getting two dimensional matrix, you'll get a t plus one dimensional matrix. The overall communication, instead of, instead of being four square, it'll become n two over t plus one. It will work only when n is greater than 3t, otherwise the major local function does not work. You need a completely connected network, so you, everybody has to be able to communicate to everybody. You need a synchronous network, you, you, you have to know that the first round is over and then initiate the second round. And you have a fully closed system where everybody knows all the participants who are participating in the agreement. Now notice that each of these are major, major drawbacks for our cryptocurrency. We don't have time for running a huge number of rounds. We don't have space for storing p plus one dimensional matrices. We don't have the network complexity to, to send the n to the power t plus one where n will run in, in uh, millions and uh, t also could be in millions. So you don't have the bandwidth. You, you, you cannot assume that only less than one third will be faulty. Uh, you cannot assure n is greater than 3t where t is number of faults and n is total number of nodes. You don't have a completely connected network. The, our uh, network connected is very sparse. You have no idea of, of whether the network is synchronous or not. You don't know when to stop the first round, start the second round. And 
it could be an open system where you actually do not even know who are all the miners around who have to agree. So there is no way to say it is a uh, uh, consensus among some uh, elite group of nodes and everybody knows each other. So that's also not the case. So there are major, major drawbacks that not all of the drawbacks can be uh, addressed by distributed computing alone. So actually none of these. So let us bring in another field so called cryptography and try to solve some of the drawbacks. Then we'll bring in a third field called game theory and eliminate all of these drawbacks. And then at that point, we'll get a very pleasing solution to the problem of cryptocurrencies in general for present agreement. So I will take a break here. When we come back after the break, uh, we'll, we'll have another hour session where I'll show you how cryptography will give a miniature solution which will uh, remove certain drawbacks like in, in not be greater than 3T, but will not remove certain drawbacks like flow system and other things. So, so uh, certain drawbacks will be removed. Uh, T plus one complexity will not be removed. So certain drawbacks will be removed by cryptography, certain will remain, then all drawbacks will be removed by game theory.